Hi, my name's Lauren. Welcome to our online service today. Though we're not together physically, our God has still called us together by his spirit wherever we are to hear from his word, to worship him in song and to spend time together in prayer. Hear these words from Revelation. Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Today we're continuing our series in How to Grow in Faith and Mark Simon will be preaching to us from 1 Timothy 6 on generosity. We look forward to hearing from him a little later, but to begin our service together, let's pray. Father, we thank you that even in the midst of ongoing restrictions and uncertainty, we can still gather in some form to worship our King Jesus, who is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and praise. Remind us by your spirit today that you are powerfully at work in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now join together in song as we worship our great God.
Our reading today is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10, and verses 17 to 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation, and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming of age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. There are lots of things that you can do with coins, but have you ever thought of a coin Olympics? Well, here we are at the Coin Olympics and our competitors are limbering up. Look at them, they're really shiny, ready to uh, participate in our events. Oh, the $2, $1, 50 cent, 20 cent piece. They're both ready to, all oh, ready to go. This is going to be big. Okay, we're starting with our 100 metre sprint. There goes our $1 and our 2, followed by our 50 cents and our 20 cents. And they're rolling towards the finish line. It looks oh. like the 20 cents is going to get that. No! no. Oh. He was outpipped by the $1 coin. Oh, let's, uh, oh. let's wait for the official confirmation of this. Yes, it yes. looks like it's, it's definitely the $1. All right, our second event is the long jump. Oh, how far are they going to go? We've got our gold coins on the left, our silver coins on the right. Let's see how we go. All right. It's the $1 up against the 50 cents. Oh. One dollar's got a head there. Uh, mm, Here yeah. comes the two dollars. <gasps> to two dollars. The two dollar just outstrips everybody else by the looks of it. That's a famous victory. Oh, oh the, the, just the gut wrenching scenes for the silver oh, coins. Yeah. Synchronized spinning. This is interesting. Well, it's a very, uh, very maligned event, but oh, oh, that looks bad. Oh, oh. <laughs> those one dollars. They're, they're not holding up after their first win in the first event no, that's definitely they, they get a false start here so the one dollars get another spin okay let's see Can they do better that's looking more promising i'm sure though one of them's going a bit slower oh. no no definitely not synchronized oh, not think together i think they've left the door ajar for the two dollars oh let's see how the two dollars go this time Oh, that looks like they're very synchronized oh, together oh, well done full mark judges score they win gold ah platform diving Interesting. Okay. Starting with a two dollar. Oh, what a dive! That was fantastic. Mm, that was, that a was very amazing. Good dive. Yep. Well, the the one dollar coin is up. A hush comes over the stadium. Oh, that was. That was classic. a very good classic dive. Classic. Nice and high. Yes. Mm, a lot of splash. Here's a fifty. Ooh, Very good entry yeah. there. Looked like he may have hit the side of the bucket on the way in. Well, here we go. 20 cents. Oh, disappointing. Mm. It's a disappointing way to end. Complete sink to the bottom. Yep, absolutely. Coaches will not be happy. Well, I think we've got a winner here. Let's see it in the slow motion. It is the $1. That column shooting to the sky. Yeah, very good. Good splash, good height. Well, here's our uh, final medal tally. Ah, and we've got our dollar coins are in the lead. Two golds. There are heaps of good things you can do with money, like holding entertaining coin games. Or you could do something more serious as well, like 
giving money to charity or helping out a friend or spending it on someone in need. But sometimes we find ourselves doing things that are really not so good, like keeping all of our money to ourselves and not sharing it or wasting it on something that doesn't really matter and won't last. Or sometimes we try and get even more of it, we trick people into giving us more money. These things are really unhelpful. Lucky the Bible helps us understand money. 1 Timothy 6 is especially challenging because it says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That means lots of bad things happen because of money. And it goes on to say that money sometimes distracts us from loving God because we think that money is more important than him. Now, this is probably worst of all, and we should never treat money as a god. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with having money and you're allowed to spend it on stuff that you want, but just don't get confused and fall in love with money. Instead, think of some of the great ways that you could use it. Hold a coin Olympics. 50 cents would be great for propping up a wobbly chair. Or, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, those who are rich should become rich in good deeds. So spend your money on other people. Give money to the poor. Spend some of your money to help support churches, missionaries. Or just use it in some way to serve God. I know you kids are probably not rich yet, but now is a really good time to start thinking about how you use money. Start with the little bit that you do have and don't forget to fall in love with God and not with money. Money is powerful. In modern life, money does make the world go round. We rarely leave home without it. We work for it, save it, spend it, give it. But I don't want to talk only about money, because money is just a tool which can be used for good or bad. Our attitude to money can help us grow in faith or struggle in faith. And so while I'll begin with some observations about money, I want to move then and talk more about an attitude of generosity as a key to growing in faith. Firstly though, money is powerful because it can mask my need for God. If you give someone enough money, they can buy a lot of material security and comfort in their life. They can surround themselves with the latest entertainment and activities and people so that they don't give a second thought to God. And this may be why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, money can make us arrogant and mask the God-shaped hole in our hearts. Secondly, money can tempt me to do foolish things. Money's a bit like bait that people will do virtually anything for. There are TV game shows like Survivor where people will endure degradation and starvation and betrayal. Why? For the slim chance of winning that big fat prize check. And there's a similar formula at work in other reality shows, The Block and Big Brother. But even if you're not chasing your 15 minutes of fame through reality TV, people all around Melbourne suburbs are wanting to get rich quick through lotteries or other forms of gambling. They click on a link in an email promising a prize or some bequest or a chance to win. They enroll in investment seminars and, and pursue wealth creation strategies. That desire for acquisitions, for material things, that's a problem and it's identified in 1 Timothy. Those who want to get rich are prone to do foolish things. Their pursuit of riches can tempt them to act dishonestly. When you prepare your taxes each year, is there a little part of you that thinks about claiming more deductions than you're entitled to? 
or not including some of your income? That's the love of money whispering to your soul that being rich is better than being honest. Now, despite those negative things, money can be an incredible power for good. Psalm 112 verse 9, Those who give generously to those in need will never be forgotten. They'll have influence and honour. See, we can use money to create eternal impact. Money can put food on the table, put a roof over someone's head. It can fund an MAF plane bringing hope and supplies to a remote community. Christian generosity can meet immediate material needs. And in so doing, it can contribute to the growth of God's eternal kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We can store up treasure in heaven by using our finances generously in everyday life to advance the cause of God and to bring glory and praise to Jesus. When you share your faith, when you act for godly justice, when you support Christian witness here in Australia or abroad, you're storing up treasure in heaven. And those acts of generosity, they result in thanksgiving to God. Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 11 says, You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, as someone who's lived overseas, training Indonesian pastors and preachers, I've experienced firsthand their gratitude for your generosity. See, they praise God that Australian Christians were partnering with them and helping them to reach their nation with the gospel and to strengthen the church. There's rejoicing in heaven when we generously give to ministries that build up God's people and extend God's kingdom. Fourthly, money can make life better. Some people have this view of God as the great miser in the sky, always frowning, always disapproving, never satisfied. But that's not the God of the Bible. God loves you extravagantly. God delights to see his people filled with joy because they're secure in his love and walking faithfully in his ways. And Jesus is our role model in this. Jesus went to parties. Jesus was at feasts where people ate, drank and were merry. Jesus could celebrate and enjoy life the material blessings of life because he wasn't idolizing them and he wasn't chasing them. He was just receiving them and sharing them with thanks. So money honestly earned and money wisely managed, that can help us enjoy relationships with family and friends. It enables us to take care of ourselves with life-giving recreation and, and Sabbath rest times. And our passage today, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, affirms that it's God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So let's not be killjoys who refuse to thank God and enjoy the provisions that he does give, whether they're big or small. Now, we've seen that money is powerful because it can mask the need of God and it can tempt us to do foolish things, but also on the other hand, it can be used to create eternal impact and it can be used to enjoy life. In order to avoid the negatives of money and amplify the positives, we need to get our priorities right. And here are three key ones. Firstly, trust God, not wealth. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, 
who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. This pandemic has reminded us all that life is fragile. It's precious. It shouldn't be taken for granted. When we put our hope in God, we remember that riches and and health and, and social freedoms, they may come and go. But a relationship with God that Jesus has won for us, that can never be taken away. I mentioned Matthew 6, 19 earlier. Store up treasures in heaven, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, if you're generous towards God and trust him and put your hope in him, then you'll be drawn closer to him as you pursue God's priorities. And there's this cycle that your heart follows what you invest in, what you put your time and energy and your money into. As you invest in godly projects and endeavors, your affections follow and they're drawn closer to God's kingdom, to God's priorities and to God himself. A second wealth priority is this. Pursue a simple lifestyle. We live in a world of grossly unequal wealth distribution. And so Christians should consciously adopt a simple lifestyle in order to benefit those in need. When Paul was instructing the young churches of Greece about financial stewardship, he said, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is a matter of global economic justice. When the West overconsumes energy and clothes and food, the two-thirds world bears the cost, with unbearable droughts and floods and famines. The two-thirds world bears the cost for our addiction to fast fashion, and annual technology upgrades, as workers in their sweatshops and factories live like slaves. Now, a commitment to simple lifestyle means that we should push retailers to adopt ethical supply chains. We should consider whether or not we need that new upgrade. Or could something refurbished or reused as a product do? And being committed to a simple lifestyle means living within our means. 1 Timothy 6 states it clearly. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Contentment or discontentment are learned attitudes. And the advertising industry constantly schools us in discontentment because discontentment with what we have makes you want something new. But endless consumption is killing our planet. It's not what we were created for. We were created for relationship with God and one another. And as we rest secure in Him and in His already abundant provision, we reorient our desires away from material acquisition and consumption and towards God's generosity and the full life that Jesus promises. Because that full life doesn't need gadgets and gizmos, doesn't need gourmet dining or glamorous getaways. Living simply is an expression of Christian discipleship. So do a budget, plan your expenditure, Be wary of buy now, pay later schemes. Find joy in the beauty around you, in nature, in socialising, in serving, in making things. And by living simply, you'll be freeing up resources with which you can then be even more generous with those in need. A third priority is to give God the first fruits, not the leftovers. When you work in farming, 
and you see the first grains ripen or the first fruit on the tree reach maturity or the first lambs born, it's a great relief. You've made it this far. The weather, the pests or, or thieves haven't spoiled your investment and hard work. Now what you do at that point shows where your faith is. Do you hoard or do you honour God with these first fruits? The Old Testament instructed Israel to offer these first fruits as a sacrifice to God. And that would remind them that God was the ultimate giver of the seeds, the rains, the soil, the air that brought about the harvest. So Proverbs 3.9 says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now for us today, we're not necessarily farmers, but we have regular income. And it may be tempting to treat Christian giving as a discretionary expense, something we think about after the rent and groceries, utilities, clothes and the car, and all the other things, the outings, the Netflix, the rest are covered. But when we push God to the bottom of our budget decisions, it indicates that we view him and kingdom priorities as less important. We take from his generosity, but give from our leftovers? Well, that's not honouring to God, and that's not the way to grow in faith. So if you haven't yet set up a regular pattern of giving to St Alfred's or St Luke's as your church family, please see our website for the options to do that, or contact the church office. Give God the first fruits, not the leftovers. With wealth priorities like trusting God, adopting a simple lifestyle and giving God our first fruits, we renovate our heart attitudes to money and then we can grow in godliness. And now finally, I want to share how generosity is more powerful than money. So let's talk about generosity in heart and in action. Generosity is love in action. Think about John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Our motivation and model for generosity is God's prior generosity to us. Life is a generous gift from God our Father. The morning sun, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the relationships that sustain us, the health in our bodies, the word of God written for us, these are all ours because God loves to give. He provides, he lavishes, he is the generous giver. And Jesus is the most generous person ever. He sacrificed his own life for us. No greater love has anyone than to lay down their life for a friend. And that's what Jesus does for you and for me. As 1 Corinthians 8, 9 puts it, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And so because of Christ's generosity, we have these incredible spiritual blessings in life. They're spelled out in Ephesians chapter 1. Redemption, forgiveness, knowledge of God's will and a future secure in heaven. Be generous because God has been so generous to you. And secondly, giving lets us become channels of God's generosity to others. When we are generous, we become channels of grace, channels of God's kindness and mercy to others. The antidote to the materialistic get, 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 never have enough consumerism of our culture is to live generously by grace. Each breath is by grace. Each dollar in our bank accounts is a gift of grace. The people in my life and in yours, those who know Jesus, those who don't yet, they're all expressions of God's grace to you and I. So when I choose to be generous to them, not just with my money, but with my time and my emotional resources, my prayers and my plans, and as I do all of this, I do it so God, the giver, can be praised forever. 
That's a kind of short paraphrase of 1 Peter 4, verses 8 to 11, which more fully says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace, God's generosity in all its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So while money is powerful, generosity is more powerful to help the Christian life of faith flourish. A heart shaped by generosity is going to have a tremendous impact in your own life and to all those around you, even in other countries as you give to see God's will done and his kingdom come. Amen. Now here's a helpful clip from the Bible Project that explores the centrality of generosity in the Christian life. Imagine your friend invites you to a party. You arrive and there's lots of people, decorations, food and drink. There's enough for everyone. When you're hosted by someone that generous, you don't have to worry about your needs. You can just enjoy yourself and focus on the people around you. Yeah, that's what a good host wants for her guests. And this is the picture of the world that we find in the Bible. Creation is an expression of God's generous love. He's the host and humans are his guests in a world of opportunity and abundance. And we're called to keep the party going, to spread his goodness. This is a beautiful picture, but it's not the way people experience the world. Rather, we find a world of scarcity and struggle, not abundance. And Jesus grew up in that kind of world. Under military occupation, people losing their land or families to debt and poverty. And yet, he would say things like this. Look at the birds. They don't store up food for themselves, yet they have enough. Or consider the wildflowers. They're beautiful and abundant, and they don't stress about their existence. And you all should live that way, too. But surely Jesus knew that things don't always work out. I mean, sometimes there really isn't enough. And Jesus did experience poverty firsthand, but he viewed the world through the story of the Hebrew scriptures, which claimed that our scarcity problem isn't caused by a lack of resources. Rather, the problem is our mindset that God can't be trusted. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe there isn't enough and maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. And once we're deceived into that mindset of scarcity, we can justify the impulse to take care of me and mine before anyone else. And that leads to envy and anger, violence, and a world where it seems like there's not enough. The party's over, it's turned into a battleground. But God wants humans to experience his generosity. And so he chooses one people, the family of Abraham, and he promises to give them the abundance that he wants for everybody else. God will provide what they need. All they have to do is trust his generosity. And through them, the whole world will see how generous the host really is. But that's not what happens. Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, enter a land of abundance and they promptly forget the host who gave it to them. They act like it's all theirs and like there's not enough. And it leads to war and Israel's self-destruction. If I were the host of this party, I think I'd just give up. But God doesn't give up. What he does is surprising. He gives another gift. Another gift? Yeah, but this gift is different. What God gives is himself. All right, and Jesus, the host himself, comes to join in on the spoiled party. And notice, Jesus lives with the conviction that there is enough and that our generous host can be trusted. His mindset of abundance allowed him to live sacrificially and generously, even towards his enemies. And Jesus called his followers to trust in God's abundance like him. And that's why he said things like, sell your possessions and give to the poor, or don't worry about your life. He's inviting us to live by a different story, one that is built on trust in God's goodness and love. But living generously doesn't mean life is gonna go well. I mean, look at Jesus. He was betrayed by his friends and he suffered. And this was no surprise to Jesus. He knew that people would take advantage of his generosity. In fact, 
That was his plan. Really? Yeah, think about it. Jesus knows that we're all hopelessly deceived by this lie that there's not enough. Yeah, that lie needs to be defeated. And so that's what Jesus was doing when he gave us the gift of his life. Jesus' death was the ultimate expression of God's generous love. Yeah, God's love can turn death into life and scarcity back into abundance. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, you know the gift of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Jesus called his followers to live like the real party has begun. Yes, he called it the kingdom of God. And our invitation to this party is yet another gift, the personal presence of God's own spirit that can teach us how to trust the generosity of the host, just like Jesus did. Yeah, and when you believe there's enough, you start seeing opportunities for generosity everywhere with our time and money, our attention. Yes, one of the most important ways that we can experience the abundance of God's new creation is sharing with others because of our trust that God is the generous host. This Sunday at St. Luke's, we're holding a special gift day. Earlier this year, our building project Moving Forward was finished, and we now have accessible and functional entryways and toilets and car parking. We're encouraging all members of St. Luke's and St. Alfred's to make a special one-off gift to the Moving Forward Fund. Something over and above your regular church giving doesn't matter how much or how little it is, what it represents is your investment in the gospel ministries that we can now better host on site. Now, if you don't get our email newsletter, which has the details of how to give, please contact our office on 03 4949 or email us at office at stalfords.org to arrange your gift. I personally have been blown away by the generosity of everyone at both St. Alfred's and St. Luke's in the past. And I'm so thankful to God for your commitment to see God's work flourishing in Vermont and the suburbs surrounding it. May God bless you as you are a blessing to our community.
Today we've been reminded that it can be so easy to trust wealth rather than God. It can be so easy for money to mask our need for God and to tempt us to do incredibly foolish things. We can often lean on it for security and significance and rely on it to help make our lives better. We so often worship money over God. As a community each week, it's appropriate for us to acknowledge just how far short we fall of the way that our God desires us to live. Let's take a moment in silence to do this now. Please join me in the words in bold as we confess our sins to our gracious God. God of everlasting love, we confess that we have been unfaithful to you. We have worshipped other gods, money, power, pleasure and convenience. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you, your people and your world. We have not loved our neighbour as you have commanded, nor have we rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's now join together as we come before our God in prayer. Gracious Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you've promised to hear us when we pray to you. Please respond with your characteristic grace and generosity to our requests today. We pray for our church community. As we hear from the Bible about generosity today, please make us generous individuals and a generous community. Please purify us of our greed and selfishness by your Holy Spirit and forgive us. Please grow in us gratitude and contentment for the good gifts that you've given us and continue to enrich us with every day for life and health and safety, freedom to work and leisure to rest. Help us to thank you as we should and please grow generosity in our hearts. Help us to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Help us to store up treasures in heaven, invest in eternal value and grab hold of the true life that Jesus offers in your kingdom. We ask too that you would help us to encourage one another and to be patient with one another, one another as we begin to return to gatherings after many months apart. Grant that we would not take for granted the gift that your gathered church is to us, but help us to build up your church and our fellow believers here on Sundays, in small groups, and other opportunities we have to talk and meet together. We pray for our broader community. Please give us leaders to, who lead with wisdom and justice. Please help our current leaders like Scott Morrison and Daniel Andrews to execute their roles with diligence and concern for the people they govern. We pray for everyone facing in their various ways the ongoing medical and community challenge of COVID. Please sustain medical professionals as they help their patients. Please sustain business owners and workers facing lockdowns and uncertainty and loss. And sustain singles and families with the different challenges that households are facing. We pray finally for the world. Please enable world leaders to govern with wisdom and justice. 
bless their efforts to transition to sustainable energy generation. We pray for peace in places currently in conflict, and we ask that the peace much of the world enjoys will continue. As borders reopen, please increase the flow of your gospel message to unreached people who need your grace. Strength, strengthen those people and organisations like CMS and InterServe and others who are pursuing that goal and frustrate all who oppose it. We ask all these things in the powerful name of King Jesus who conquered death on our behalf. May his glory be known among us, in our community and throughout your world. Amen. Father, help us to trust you, not wealth. Help us to live simple lives 
and give you the first fruits, not the leftovers. Thank you that you have been abundantly generous to us through Jesus. Empower us by your spirit to become channels of your generosity and grace to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we go into another week, I just have a couple of things to draw to your attention. So firstly, we're open again for in-person services. So if you would like to attend, please pre-register via the church website. Sign in with the QR code at the door and bring proof of vaccination according to government guidelines. You can also pre-register for an open service. So that's for those who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. Our online services will also continue to be pre-recorded and uploaded. Secondly, we're currently actively seeking people to serve on parish council, wardens and the incumbency committee during 2022. Uh, if you'd like to put in a nomination, please email your nomination form to Peter McPherson this week. And finally, today we were reminded of the importance of generosity. And one concrete way of responding is by making a donation toward the St Luke's Moving Forward Building uh, Fund to help clear the outstanding debt. You're invited to make a one-time gift over and above your normal giving. You can send donations to St Alfred's electronically or just leave them at the church office in an envelope. Just make sure that you mark all donations clearly as St Luke's gift day. Thanks so much for joining us for today's service. Have a great week and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.